Hi, welcome back to the Progressive Primitivist, where we believe the only way to go forward in religion is to go back to the Bible. I'm your co-host, Jake Hysaw. You are watching one of a series of videos where we will be sharing audio recordings from the Question and Answer Open Forum at the Freed Hardeman Lectureship moderated by Guy Ian Woods and Gus Nichols from 1967 to 1973. We felt that these recordings were a blessing to us and our ministry here at the Progressive Primitivist and felt the need to share them and make them easily accessible here on YouTube. Now, we would like to preface and say that we don't endorse every answer uh, given in these recordings, but we do feel that they're a blessing to the body of Christ as we all are just here to pursue truth. Now, be sure to leave a like on our video and comment if you uh, like our content and would like to see more videos like this. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, that way you can see every time that we post videos like this. But more importantly, be sure to share this with someone that you believe would benefit from a study like this. And now, here's the open forum. Indeed, a privilege to me and one of the delights of life to appear on this program. I preach in about 40 meetings a year. And this week is the hardest week of the year physically for me, and yet one of the most delightful. And I'm always happy to be here to participate in this forum and to share in the joy that comes from listening to these great speeches made by the other brethren. Now this year our pattern will conform to the usual. I do indeed hope that you'll feel free to participate. There are no restraints whatsoever aside from Christian charity, and certainly there are no subjects that we will deliberately or purposely avoid, and we'll be glad to hear from any of you on any of these matters, on whatever side you feel disposed to speak, and we usually have several sides represented. <laughs> of course, my side and all the other sides that are wrong, and I, <laughs> I don't think that there'll be any difference this year. Now, the first question grows out of Brother Gus Nichols' speech this morning. This says on Mark 16, 14 through 20, how can the them of verse 17 be a reference to the 11 of verse 14 and not to the believers of verse 16? Well, may I say, number one, that I endorse 100% Brother Nichols' position on that passage. I thought his analysis was excellent both scripturally and grammatically. The reason the them there cannot, ref, uh, cannot refer to the he is that a pronoun must agree with its antecedent in number. You can't say them, he, so it must refer back to a plural antecedent. This is further confirmed by the fact that in the 20th verse of the 16th chapter, it is said that they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. The allusion being, of course, to the apostles who went forth. And so I share in the view, as expressed this morning by Brother Nichols in his very excellent presentation along that line. This question continues, may not the them of verse 17 include some first century Christians inasmuch as Jesus does not here specify the conditions under which these signs will follow, nor for how long. I don't think that that conclusion follows for the reasons just set out. Now, we'll present two or three of these matters and then uh, uh, throw it open to uh, discussion. Number one, did the baptismal measure give power to speak in tongues, heal the sick, and raise the dead? It did in the case of the apostles. Now, in, ver in the, the next question here, if the household of Cornelius received the baptismal measure, then would it not follow they could do what the apostles did? Not necessarily. I don't think that conclusion follows. I might say, number one, that it's long been my conviction that the house of Cornelius did receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I just don't see how the Holy Spirit could have said it uh, in any other way if he didn't say it in the way that he said it. It made Peter remember the promise that the Lord gave that they were to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and if they were not baptized, then Peter's memory was at fault or his application was erroneous because it was not uh, the baptism, uh, in which case his memory 
uh, was at fault. I certainly don't think Peter's memory was at fault. Furthermore, it says they received the like gift. It also says it fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. I traced out the similarity of those statements with others found a while back, and the expression occurs many times in the Greek Testament. And in every instance, it sets out identity, not similarity, but identity. As an example, Peter said, or rather Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, As I gave order to the churches of Galatia, so also do you. Now, was the order that Paul gave to the Galatian churches somewhat different from that to Corinth? Well, if not then, then the baptismal measure at the house of Cornelius, or the measure at the house of Cornelius, was the same. This uh, query uh, says, I do not believe Cornelius and the household receive, or his household received the baptismal measure, but simply a gift. Well, if when the apostle was describing it and Luke was recounting it, if he didn't say that they received it exactly as they did on the day of Pentecost, then I just don't know what he'd have to say in order to say it, if he didn't say it when he did say it. I think he said it when he said it, and thus not necessary to explain what he would have to say in order to say it. <laughs> and so, uh, I, Brother Nichols, get up and say it if he didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Nichols says that he endorses it, and I'm, I was sure that he would and did, because Brother Nichols is usually right on most of these matters. <laughs> Please comment on Amos 6.5. Can this safely be used as an argument against instrumental music? Woe unto them that invent unto themselves instruments of music like David. Now, we have some squeamish brethren that think that it can't be, but I'm not one of them. I believe that it can be, and I do use it as evidence of the fact that the Lord is not pleased and never was pleased with the use of instrumental music in worship. Now, let me point out to you this that the strains of mechanical music were never heard in Israel until the time of David. For 400 years after the law was given on Sinai, instrumental music was not used. And you remember this, please. There were just the same stern warnings against adding to God's Word uh, under the old order as there is under the new. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2, Thou shalt not add unto that which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it. And for 400 years, instrumental music was not heard in Israel as a part of the worship. And when it was introduced, David took full credit for it. He said in 1 Chronicles 23, 5, The instruments which I made, said David, to praise God therewith. And again and again in the books of the Chronicles, the contrast is sharply drawn between two expressions. Now watch them. The song of the Lord and the instruments of David. The song of the Lord and the instruments of David. Now, someone will come up, of course, first with the fact that it's commanded in the Psalms. Now let me point out to you this. Number one, that after Israel adopted its use, the Lord tolerated it and actually regulated it. Let me give an example. In the matter of the kingdom, God never intended that Israel should have a kingdom, at least in the fashion that it came about. When Samuel approached God about it and complained that he'd been rejected, God said to him, they haven't rejected you, they've rejected me, that I should not reign over Israel. They actually had a king, and it was God. But then, after they insisted upon having a king like the nations about them, the Lord not only gave them a king, uh, but named him. But yet he was never in his plan that it should be done as it was. One of the prophets, Amos, for example, or Hosea it was, said, I gave them a king in mine anger, and I took him away in my wrath. It was not the Lord's intention that such should be. And then, of course, in the New Testament, it is conspicuous by its absence. Now in Second Chronicles 29, 25, I endorse without hesitation Adam Clark's excellent comments on that, showing that the command was not to set the instruments in, but the Levites, and that's a matter of uh, 
uh, the uh, uh, critical examination of the text there, and I stand upon what Clark said with reference to it. Now, I'm quite sure I'll get a response to this. Who wishes to be the first speaker, number one? Anybody want to comment on this? Uh, well, that he polluted Indeed. Indeed so. He tolerated it, but it was not a part of his plan. From the beginning, it was not so. Exactly so. All right. Anybody else on it? Where yes, ma'am. I beg your pardon. Where I'm just not hearing you. I'm sorry. Well, in the fact that they were introducing it into the worship. Now, of course, David did not himself bring into existence instruments of music. But he did introduce it into the worship. And by virtue of the fact that it's used in the worship, such then, of course, becomes wrong. And I do not hesitate to use this passage. Now, I know we have some brethren that think it's an improper use of it. But I certainly am not one of them. And for the reasons that I have here set up. All right. Now, <clears throat> yes. All right, sir. Because of the context of the name of the sixth chapter, I believe it does harm to use this scripture in refuting the argument of one who believes in using the name. And I feel that it creates within them the idea that we don't have proper scriptures to refute the name of the name. Well, thank you for your statement, but I disagree heartily with what you say. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Just like he got away with more than one wife. <laughs> All right. Take it up with Mr. Clark sometime. Uh, <clears throat> anything further now on this by any of us? We've clearly set out the two issues, and uh, <clears throat> I, we'll never settle it. We don't try to settle these things. We just discuss them here. And to let you see what can be said on both sides of it. Now, as to a passage being uh, improper to use, it's never improper to use any passage that teaches the truth. It makes no difference how much of what effect it has. The Baptists reject Acts 2.38, but I don't hesitate to use it in debate with it. All right, sir. The fact that the 11 and then adding the 5 to the 11, how does the 5 figure into that? Well, simply because the number 11 or 12 really was not maintained after the uh, church was established. And the word apostle itself was extended to include more than the 12. Barnabas himself is referred to as an apostle. There are others that were called apostles. That number was not maintained. I definitely believe that Matthias did take the place of Judas. But I, I don't think that, it, uh, that Paul, uh, I don't think we have any problem in saying that Paul was also one either. All right? Well, then, uh, also with that, how does it figure in these times that Paul didn't believe adding five to the eleven as he takes part uh, and he had the same ability to take? Well, you see, the baptism of the Spirit came after Matthias was selected. That preceded the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. Well, all right, that's, a, that's enough on that now. Let's pass to another subject here. Please discuss Phoebe as a deaconess in the church. Well, I think she was definitely a deaconess. The word servant there is translated from the a feminine form of the word diakonos, which is the ordinary word for deacon, but that, that is in the, the masculine form of it, but that doesn't mean that she was an official of the church in the sense that we think of, of official deacons. I don't like the word official in that connection. I'm just using it to designate those who are selected to be deacons. The, word, the Greek word occurs 22 times, if I remember correctly, in the Greek text, and in only three instances does it refer to the deacons as we speak of, the, of it usually today. Uh, our Lord himself is called a deacon in the Greek text in the sense that he was a servant. 
Uh, it's interesting to me, although some authorities question this and some endorse it, that you may trace it back to the root, and the word originally meant one who kicks up the dust by hastening. Well, if you want to trace it back that far, that's a good uh, thing for the deacons to do in the church today. <laughs> be, be so busy in the Lord's work that they kick up the dust at it. Uh, I think that Phoebe performed some of the same duties that the godly sisters in any congregation today perform. You always have some sisters that can and are qualified to take care of duties and responsibilities that arise, and they're used, and they perform that service, and they're deaconesses in the sense in which Phoebe was. I know of no other sense in which it would be correct. Now, as you know, some religious groups actually have official deaconesses, but we have no indication of such in the New Testament. Anybody a comment on that? Well, all right then, I have another one here. Do any brethren claim the Spirit guides them into truth? Or only claim the Spirit directs them to certain works or locations? We've got them that claim nearly everything about it now. And I'm not trying to be facetious. There are varying degrees of error on this matter ranging all the way from some who take the position that there is a direct, abstract contact of the Holy Spirit on the heart of the Christian, uh, on, and that it conveys information and possesses uh, leadings and influences apart from the Word, on through to some who today take the position that Brother uh, Gus so effectively refuted, along with Brother Alan Hires this morning. Both of their speeches were tremendous. Uh, refuted, that is, that they actually claim to speak in tongues. There are varying degrees of it. And I'm running into it all over the country. Everywhere I go, I hear of problems along this line. And so it is not an isolated matter. It is a matter that ought to concern all of us who love the peace and harmony of the cause. It is something that I've been warning about from this platform for the last four or five years because I've been seeing traces of it all along. But it is now out in the open, and the time is here when it must be refuted. Some are taking the position that the Holy Spirit does exercise an influence apart from and independent of the word of truth, actually leading and guiding and directing. Those who take such a position feel that they are being influenced by the Holy Spirit apart from the word. And, in addition, that the Spirit does direct them to certain works. Now, we've been hearing that all through the years from denominational preachers. I long ago heard about the denominational preacher uh, whose uh, visitor came by, and he asked uh, one of the children out in the yard where his dad was, and he said his dad was upstairs uh, praying, and he said, praying about what? And praying about whether to take a church at a bigger salary. He said, well, where's your mother? He said, she's downstairs packing. <laughs> so I won't be surprised if one of these days that we hear of some brother that uh, uh, is uh, claiming that the Holy Spirit led him to move from the Church of Christ at Bug Tussle to Madison, Tennessee. <laughs> I wouldn't, wouldn't at all be surprised if that doesn't happen. Now, that is being taught today, and I feel sure that we'll have this up more and more, and it'll be discussed further in the lectureship this week and also from this platform. And I'll not uh, hesitate to receive questions on any aspect of it, and we shall be glad to discuss them. Uh, it may be that you want to discuss it a little bit at the moment. Does anybody have anything to say at the moment on it? I do have an... Uh, excuse me. You said that somebody might claim that the Spirit had led him to move. You meant directly. I meant directly, indeed. By an impact upon him, uh, by suggesting to him, to his spirit, that that's what he ought to do, apart from the wisdom that comes from the study of God's Word and the desire to do what's right. Now, I th don't let anybody misunderstand. I am not suggesting that we ought not to pray about everything. And we ought, but then there are many influences that enter into whether a fellow ought to move from one place to another, uh, all of which can be settled by an application of the principles that are taught in the New Testament. All right, sir. Brother Wood, if we embrace the idea 
that we do receive the Spirit other than separate and apart from the Word, is there any way that we can go other than by the mystical fashion of uh, what we have set aside? My observation has been that when a person comes to believe that he is the recipient of impressions and influences wrought upon him, independent of the word, that he soon gets to the point where those hunches, those leadings, those intimations are more binding upon him and more urgent than what he reads in the Bible. That's been characteristic of the denominational world uh, through the years. And to oppose a person who has that feeling makes him to feel that you are opposing the Holy Spirit. Now, with reference to this uh, latter part of this question, do some claim that the Spirit directs them to certain works or locations? A speaker on a, uh, on a, p a platform some time ago made the statement that in some mission work that was being done in connection with his activity, he was speaking on a, at a certain street corner and with mediocre results. But the Holy Spirit told him to move down to another corner. Now, mind you, that was a man claiming to be a gospel preacher. Move down to another corner, the Spirit said, and he moves down there, and his results are great. Well, now, maybe it's because that I, I just don't see through the thing, but I don't see why the Holy Spirit didn't send him to the right corner to begin with. <laughs> There's certainly a lot of wasted time there with the wrong corner. Providence in that, that is our next uh, question. I'm going, I've got it right here. Can providence be defined or described as leading by the Holy Spirit? I believe that brethren today are confusing things that differ along that line, that providence is the intervention of God in the affairs of men, but by means of and through the operations of his natural law, and not by any mysterious or direct impact upon the individual. Now, it's very possible that a person by circumstance can be led to change his way of living. I would use this illustration. A man, for example, has a serious illness. Uh, wh uh, while he re when he's recovering, he reflects upon his condition, and he realizes that had he died, he'd be, he would have been lost. And so he resolves that when he gets well, he's going to do something about his soul. And he does. Well, it can be said that there were circumstances that led to his obedience to the gospel. But let me raise this question for your contemplation. How much of the plan of salvation did that illness teach him? Everything that he, was re that he resolved to do, he already knew he ought to do it, and he learned it either directly or indirectly from the New Testament. All his illness did was to bring him to a realization he ought to do something about what he already knew with reference to his salvation. Now, to show you, friends, how far some are going on this, one man has used this illustration. One of our brethren, one of our missionaries down in South America, has preached for some years with mediocre results. But a Nazarene preacher down there who, quote, allows the Holy Spirit to lead him, unquote, has had thousands of converts. Now, what's the implication there? I don't need to draw it out for you. That means, if it means anything, if there's any point to the illustration at all, that the Holy Spirit is guiding that Nazarene preacher to preach sprinkling for baptism. Has it come to that among us, brethren? Well, I think it has. It has come to that. And it's been coming on for some time. And the reason that it's coming to that is this, that we're producing a generation of brethren who don't, not only don't know anything about the restoration movement, but they don't care anything about it. And not only that, they are doing their best to debunk and disparage and degrade the pioneer preachers. Amen. Now, none of us feel that those men were infallible, are inspired, 
Are we not even, uh, are we not susceptible to mistakes? But I tell you, brethren and sisters, I don't believe that some fellow whose only claim to scholarship is he's been sitting at the feet of denominational theologians has learned something about the Holy Spirit that J.W. McGarvey and David Lipscomb and Alexander Campbell didn't learn from the study of the Bible. And the time is here when we must do something about it. If we don't do it now, it'll be too late in the next generation. And that's why I say that the time is critical. And I appreciated particularly Brother Nichols' statement this morning in the outset when he said, these are perilous times, and they are indeed. I cover the country, I'm sure, as thoroughly or perhaps more so than the average gospel preacher since I hold meetings continuously. And I know what's happening over the country. And so <clears throat> uh, providence is not to be identified with the what is sometimes today described as the leading of the Spirit. Now then, I'm sure that be some of you want to talk a little about providence. Who has a statement? Brother Nichols, come up and talk a little about it. Please do. Come on. Let's just have a statement from Brother Nichols about providence. I think we all will appreciate what he has to say about this. How are you, Brother Nichols? Fine, Brother Nichols. Good to see you. <laughs> the word providence is just simply the word providence. God provides. When Abraham was told to offer Isaac, his son, you recall that when he rescued the son from death, that there was a ram caught by the horns in the, in the thicket here. And God had provided that sacrifice for that occasion, for that emergency. And the place was called, or God was called, Jehovah Jireh. God provided. Now, as far as we know, there may have been no miracle connected with that. But it was in a day of miracles in the first place. God spoke directly unto Abraham to offer Isaac. That was a miraculous matter. We're living in the days of a completed revelation. Or we're living in the days of continued revelation like Mormons claim, one or the other. There's no intermediate position to take. The Word of God is all-sufficient or it is not. And it claims to be all-sufficient. All Scripture is given the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And if the Bible is all sufficient, then the days of revelation are past. And all of the miracles that went along with that are past. No man can work a miracle. And as far as we know, God in providence, operates through and in harmony with the laws of nature. Man's driving down the street, operating his automobile in perfect harmony with the machinery of the machine. I call to it. He applies his brake and turns in, parks, and I talk with him. He would not have stopped had not I called upon him. But when he did stop, he did not slide the car sideways, if you please, but he operated in perfect harmony with the machinery and did the very thing I wanted done. God is at the steering wheel of his universe. He operates through his law. God is going to honor his laws. 
in the main, whether we do or not. He wants us to honor them. And for that very reason, he honors them. If God were to dishonor his law of sowing and reaping for ten years, we'd have a famine that we would perhaps not outlive at all. If he were to begin to produce crops without seed for ten years and then withdraw the miraculous, we'd have a famine because people would have lost confidence in God's laws of sowing and reaping by that time. And from the beginning of the world, God has sought to honor his laws to get us to honor them. And we prosper and are at our best when we honor his laws and comply with his will as revealed concerning all such matters. And that's true in Revelation. If he interposes a great deal and unnecessarily in here and making direct revelations, it'll make the word of God of none effect. And the first thing we know, we won't have any respect for the word of God, just like we wouldn't have any respect for his natural laws uh, in the natural realm of sowing and reaping. If he were to interfere with that and feed us with manna for a while, we wouldn't sow and reap. So God does answer prayer. God uh, does exercise providential care over us. But he seeks to honor his laws while doing it. And I don't know that he ever violates them since the days of Revelation have been completed. Thank you, Brother. <clears throat> well, that's a marvelous statement. <clears throat> And it's certainly true that the Lord operates in harmony with his law and never in violation of it. I think, as Brother Nichols pointed out at the end there, that even the miracles were just operations of a higher law and not in conflict with natural law. As a matter of fact, um, uh, the Lord himself, who is the author of law, could not violate the law. If he chose at any time in the past to operate on a different basis, it be no, would not be in violation of it or in conflict with it. I often use this illustration. Uh, the miracle at Canaan, Galilee, our, first, our Lord's first miracle, when he turned water into wine, has been the object of a great amount of scoffing on the part of unbelievers. But the truth of the business is the Lord turns water into wine every year. What he did on that occasion, he does every year. The only difference being that in that case he speeded the process. He did in an instant what he ordinarily takes several months to do. Well, someone might say, well, that's different, but is it really? Then it would be for me to ask him to suspend his natural laws regarding healing, and the use of, the, of uh, surgery, the miracle medicines, the various healing techniques and so on, to suspend those and do it independently of him. He's not going to do it any more than he'll feed me independently. And yet, it's the Lord that does it. It's the Lord that does it. Some time ago, when in a meeting in Baltimore, Maryland, I was in a bookstore browsing around one day, and a, a little Church of God preacher, uh, who evidently had had some contact with our brethren through the years, uh, began to take some digs at me. I, I could detect a barb every once in a while in what he was saying. Uh, he finally got around to the question of uh, healing. He said, Do you believe in divine healing? I said, Certainly. There isn't any other kind. Any healing that occurs is in the final analysis done by the Lord. Well, that didn't satisfy him. He said, do you believe in miraculous divine healing? I said, no, because the Bible teaches that it is. He said, I'd be afraid to make such a statement like that. He said, we've got people in our church that I know have been healed. I said, right on the street, here's a Christian science organization. they got people down there they think have been healed. Do you think they're telling the truth? He said, no, I think they're a bunch of fakes. I said, why should I believe you on no better testimony? Friends, let me point out to you this. There are at least a dozen and a half or two dozen different groups in this country that claim divine healing, miraculous divine healing. But did you know that not a one of them thinks that any of the rest of them are telling the truth? Every one of them thinks all the rest of them are a bunch of fakes. I tell them I just do what they do, plus one. I just add one more to the list. And most of them know it too. I think it's a crime against humanity what is today being done 
by some of these professional divine healers. And I just wonder when some of our brethren will begin to attempt to practice it. Over here at Lexington, Tennessee, a, few, a good many years ago, was a fellow over there engaged in what he claimed was miraculous divine healing. He was a hol holiness of some sort. And while, of course, he didn't charge to um, heal, it did require a donation of a dollar and a half to qualify to get in the prayer line. And they had been healing people, so they claimed night after night of ulcers, heart trouble, headaches, inward conditions, mind you, not susceptible of diagnosis by the average person. But one day or one night, a fellow got in the line that just had one leg. Now, that was a matter of a, of a different nature. And they realized that they'd have to do some quick thinking, which they did. One of the workers got him off to one side and said, Now, there's a thing about this that you haven't thought of that ought to be explained to you before we proceed. No question but what the Lord can heal you. But had you thought about this, one of these days you're going on to heaven. And when you get up there, you'll have the leg you lost. But if you get another one here tonight, <laughs> so, so he decided that he'd just wait and have two legs in heaven. Well, all right, now who has something? Yeah, that's right. Yes, sir. There are five different things the Lord did. He exercised power over storms, uh, power over the material world, changing, uh, uh, could change, uh, well, he did change, uh, multiply fish and bread. Uh, he had power over um, death. He could heal. He had power over the unseen uh, world, that is, the demons, by able to, being able to cast them out. Now, sometimes they claim they can put the doctors out of business. Why don't they put the bakeries out of business? It would be no more of a miracle. Of course, we understand it's impossible, but I never would have thought the day would come when we'd be making arguments that we used to make uh, with the holiness preachers. I was in a meeting in San Diego, California a few months ago. The preacher in that congregation took some of us up into a classroom where he had two huge charts stretched across the wall on which he had a lot of material in which he attempted to prove speaking in tongues, miraculous divine healing, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I've been debating holiness preachers for a quarter of a century, and I have yet to meet one of them that didn't do a better job than he did in presenting his material. I went down the line right behind him, answering his arguments, and each one of them I'd say, now what do you have to say in reply to that? He said, I don't know what to say in answer to it, and I see I got to study it some more. But he never did anything about it except that he renounced the church. And I was there at the time in the meeting. Now, that was not an example of a man of ignorance. He'd been preaching there for three years. He had been a student in times past in one of our Christian colleges. He had been preaching for 25 years. He was not an ignoramus, but he had allowed himself to be led into an emotional state that it led him away from the truth. And therein is the danger involved in this matter. But then, I understand that today we have not attempted, but we shall later go into detail in discussing the arguments that are made along this line as they are brought up in the forum. These other brethren will do so in their discussions. But today we're discussing some of the effects of the matter. Now, who has something further on this matter of providence? Yes, sir. Well, I think that there's, a, there's ground for difference of opinion among brethren with reference to some of the terminology that may be used. Uh, I personally prefer to speak of the Holy Spirit influencing us by means of or through the word of truth, and by which I don't mean that the Spirit is the word of truth. I don't mean, I don't subscribe to the doctrine of the word only, as we're sometimes accused of subscribing to. Uh, I believe that it is the, the, all of the power of deity is back of it, and that it is the Holy Spirit influencing us when we are influenced by the word, because the, in, the Holy Spirit's instrument is the word. But that we will discuss in greater detail later. I don't want to anticipate these brethren in these uh, forums, I don't feel, uh, that is, in these panels. 
I don't feel it'd be right thus early in the matter to do it. Although we will before this week passes, I shall express from this platform my views with reference to the various, all of the various issues involved. But I do feel that we ought to wait until later in the week to discuss in detail the arguments that are involved. Does anybody have a further? All right. Brother Wood, I'd like to make a comment on Act 239, whether that is miraculous still, or whether it is what is sometimes referred to. I remember the third half of the ordinary gift of industry of that in the time. Well, I've, uh, I've done that time and again from this platform. I've expressed my position on that, and I possibly will later this week. Uh, you said the 39th, uh, uh, the 30, the, I think you meant the 38th, the 39th verse there is the promise is unto you. I believe that our brethren sometimes miss the point as to what the promise is. The word, the expression, the promise, has a definite theological significance. It's used repeatedly in the Bible. For example, in Galatians 3 and 29, uh, and if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, the promise. The promise that God made to Abraham. Well, that's stated in that verse. The promise is unto you, that is to you Jews. Unto your children, that is to children of Jews. Unto them that are far off, that's the Gentile. And so what is there said is simply this, that the promise is to Jew and Gentile. Now, what promise? Salvation through the seed of Abraham. And that, of course, was Christ. Well, I'm certain that that's involved. And... Uh, as to the definite meaning of the gift of the Holy Spirit, I think there's room for difference of opinion as to the meaning of that. Now, Brother Nichols and I differ as to what we think that phrase means. We do not differ as to the outcome of it. Neither one of us feels that the gift there has anything to do with any miraculous measure today. Neither one of us thinks that the Holy Spirit there supplants the Word in the heart. We just don't agree as to what the passage means. Well, I suppose that that would be true of, uh, of, uh, of any of us with reference to many, many passages of Scripture. There are many passages that uh, our background, our study, uh, what we think about other matters, all of that enters into our understanding or our ability to understand, maybe to misunderstand a passage. And I don't think it makes any difference as to the outcome of this controversy that's raging in the brotherhood today as to whether or not one thinks it's a miraculous gift or whether one thinks that it's the ordinary gift. I don't think it is. I think it's just a question of an interpretation of that passage. But that's not the issue today. The issue is this. Does the Holy Spirit do things to you that the Word can't? Now that's the real issue. And and I think so too, Brother Nichols. I think it's contrary to what our brethren have stood for through the years. And I tell you this, friends, not any, not even including Moses Lord, ever taught that the Holy Spirit conveys information apart from the Word. Now, some of those brethren back there, in arguing about these matters, they used different terminology, and they didn't agree on what words would be used to describe the relationship of the Holy Spirit to the human spirit, just like that. There's legitimate ground for difference of opinion today uh, over the use of such terms. But I tell you solemnly from this pulpit, and I'm prepared to prove it from the authorities themselves, which I have with me, that no man of prominence in the days of the past ever took the position that the Holy Spirit leads, guides, directs, influences the individual apart from and independent of the word of truth. If it did, then what Brother Nichols said that the Word of God lacks all sufficiency because it would take that leading plus the Word to get all of it done. Now, that's the real issue, and we ought not to be confused now uh, by side issues that will be brought up with reference to it. The only question is, how does the Holy Spirit lead? And we will, and these brethren will, be discussing that in detail. <laughs> I'd like to return to just one thing regarding what you said to, on Acts chapter 2, verse 38. It seems to me that it's commendable, obviously, to have the spirit of Christian charity and recognize that may be some difference of opinion regarding some of these things. Yet I think we need to underscore the idea that to, uh, what the Apostle Peter is saying here is not merely a matter of interpretation. It says either one or the other. It can't be both. It may mean one or the other. 
and you and I might agree or disagree, and either one of us might well be mistaken. But I think we do need to underscore the idea that what the Scripture says, it says definitely, and it's not a matter of uh, interpretation as to what the, the Scripture itself indicates. I may not understand it, but what it says, I need to make sure that I do understand, and then we'll be agreed with the that. Well, it's certainly nice to be able to oversimplify like that. If we could just do that with reference to all of our issues, we'd have them made. Uh, I agree with you that it does teach the truth, but I do not agree that it is possible for us always, everybody, to arrive at the same conclusion about everything. And that's why I say uh, that I think that there is uh, ground for differences of opinion on it. I'd, I'd I think that the position I hold on it, if you say you disagree with me, I think you're wrong. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, I would switch over to your position, obviously. But then I do feel that there's some matters that are not cl as clearly taught in the Bible as other matters. And I believe that. Here is a rule of interpretation that's been a great deal of comfort to me through the years that I've used, and I believe it's a sound I might preface what I'm about to say with this observation. If you think you've got to explain every passage of Scripture satisfactorily to the fellow that asks you, you're in for a lot of trouble. You're going to be unhappy a good bit of your time because there's some passages that you won't be able to explain and there's some you can't explain that won't suit the fellow that you're explaining it to. So here is a rule of interpretation that I've found highly satisfying. That which is of greatest importance to our salvation that which you've got to know in order to get to heaven is set out in the simplest, plainest fashion in the Bible. That which is of comparative importance is set out less clearly. Now that there are some things that are easier to understand than others is obvious. There are some things that it's more necessary to understand than others. For example, it's much more necessary for one to know what the Lord meant when he said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Then references to the mark of the beast, the binding of Satan, the opening of the seven vials, the sounding of the trumpets. Undoubtedly that's so. Well, I would then gauge the importance of a passage of Scripture to me proportionate to my ability to understand it. I don't believe the Lord has offered us salvation and then put it out there just a little bit beyond my ability to reach it. I think it's in the mental within the reach of the mental grasp of us all. Now, it is certainly true, and I, I was facetious in what I said in reply there. It is true that there always is definite truth in every passage. That's right. The, the Bible doesn't teach two or three different things. Uh, whatever it means, it means it, and it doesn't mean anything else than that, that. That's right. And I wouldn't hesitate to say that with reference to any passage. As a matter of fact, it's never right to use any verse in any sense other than that than the writer used it. Now, we might say that some conclusions would follow from it, some deductions, but if we're going to use the passage at all, we ought to use it in the sense that the writer used it. And denominational preachers, of course, don't hesitate to tell you that they're using it in some other sense. They'll say, now, this means thus and so, but I propose to use it in this sense, in a sense other than what they say it means. Well, that's what makes people think you can prove anything with the Bible. You can't prove anything by it except what it was intended to prove. Because truth is definite and static in its nature. And it doesn't vary through the years. And therefore the New Testament teaches the same thing now on the work of the Holy Spirit that it taught 10 years ago or 100 years ago or nearly 2,000 years ago. It's our responsibility to find out what it is. I think we've got time for one more statement. All right, sir. Look at the question. No, it was a comment from Brother Harris. I, I beg your pardon, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, well, now, Herbert W. Armstrong's son in Pasadena, California, teaches that Christ was Melchizedek of the Old Testament. He also says that Christ will return in 1975. He bases his conviction on Matthew, the 24th chapter. That fellow is liable to say anything out there. <laughs> I tell you. Now, that, there again is evidence of the fact that we need to do a lot of teaching. Do you know, friends, that we're getting people among us that are being influenced by this fellow Armstrong? Every once in a while, somebody asks me, you know that fellow, said he preaches a lot of good things. Well, the trouble with a lot of our folks today, they don't know what's the difference between good and bad things, so far as the Bible is concerned. And... Yeah, well, I'm going to say that I'm going to because I don't preach like that. Well... <laughs> well 
Brother Nichols, one reason why people today are influenced by such things that too many of us have quit emphasizing the fundamentals of the faith. I want to ask you, brethren, to preach. How long has it been since you preached a sermon on the operation of the Holy Spirit, the establishment of the church, the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, the proper division of the Word of God? You, we forget that every generation has to be taught these things over and over again. It's just as strange to the next generation as it was to us before we ever learned it. We forget that. And so I hope that in this introductory presentation today that we're impressed with that fact. Now, thank you for the questions. I, I'd like to say that we'll deal with just as many of them as we can. But you see the situation. Continue to hand them to me because the more questions we have the greater variety that we have to offer. Thank you very much. Again, thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, if you like our content, if you want to see more videos like this, make sure you leave a thumbs up on our video and you comment uh, what you thought in the comment section. But also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way you can see uh, our content and whenever we post content. And make sure you follow us on our social medias in the description below. Uh, thank you again. See you next time.